My name is Effie Vajena. I'm at the University of Zurich and where I work on health ethics and policy. And I will have to start with a very disappointing announcement. None of us up here is going to dance. And the reason is not because we're not talented dancers, but we're ethicists and lawyers, most of us, and so we, it will take a long time to agree on the tune. So, you st um, so stay with us while we're trying to discuss some of the ethics, um, ethical and legal issues in DDD. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome you to this panel, and I'm really grateful to um, DDD and all of you that um, organize the program. Um, it's a special meeting, and in the last at least two meetings, I think in all of them, there was a discussion about ethics, which is interesting in two ways. First, I think it shows that DDD is facing ethical challenges, but also, and perhaps more interestingly, that those involved with DDD want to address them. They don't want to sweep them under the carpet. They want to have an open discussion about them and find solutions. So um, I'll briefly say what we did um, last time and where we're going now, and then I'll open it up to our speakers. So in the last um, meeting, I think we started, we started scratching the surface a little bit about what are the big categories of ethical issues that we're dealing with uh, in DDD. And we grouped them in some categories, the um, ethical questions that are asked due to the methodology we're using, the kind of context we have now, what the specific requirements are there, and how we can legitimize the activity in terms of making it acceptable um, in, in the public health practice and research. And back then, we, so in, on the basis of that discussion, we produced a paper, you're welcome to have a look at this, and that's what, we have a chart looking at different aspects, different problems, and different ethical values that are at stake. So I won't spend your time on, on that. Um, what we want to do today is to look and collect maybe more issues that we need to, um, to address. We're going to pay some more attention to telecom um, data that we didn't speak very much about in our previous paper. And what we need to, um, what we're going to do as well is to look with our lawyers about whether the regulatory needle is moving. Um, and that's the ethical and regulatory needle, and see if it is moving in which direction it's going to go. Um, one of the big questions we're going to look at, and you're all thinking about, and we heard about it again and again today, is that big question of privacy. Uh, I don't know how many of you may have heard that it isn't just a question of privacy in DDD, it is the question of our time. One that I think, um, and I think I put that slide up because I, I do think it's indicative to the, the magnitude of the issue, the United Nations Human Rights Council decided to appoint a special rapporteur that is going to discuss and re-examine re the right to privacy in the digital era. So this is our global issue, our global problem, our global challenge, and uh, as the discussion evolves in DDD, I think it will have a lot to do with what's going on in this other domain. So, um, without more, um, more from me, we're going to move to our speakers. Um, we're going to do this as follows. We have three speakers um, that they're going to give a short presentation and then we'll open it up to discussion. So, I will start with um, Alexander, uh, Alexander Matic. Alexander is a researcher at Telefonica uh, Research in Barcelona, and he holds a PhD, a PhD degree in telecommunications from the University of Trento in Italy. His focus and his research include ubiquitous and mobile computing, um, context-aware systems, um, health, pervasive healthcare and social computing, and what he's trying to address is um, and focuses on data mining techniques that look at various challenges um, into how trying to understand, uh, achieve rather, how digital traces into real world become applications. He's also a general co-chair of the MindCare Symposium and the co-chair of Pervasive Health Conference. And we are going to hear from you, Alexander. So we have an Alexander and an Alessandro in the panel. Um, okay, I don't know if you can get that. So it's the same name, it's just uh, I have a weird spelling, actually. So thank you, uh, Effie, for a nice introduction, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, 
uh, background and, and the benefits of using uh, mobile network data for public health. And uh, I will also discuss some challenges uh, related to mostly um, ethical uh, concerns, but uh, during the discussion we will uh, we'll get deeper into that. Um, so um, I, I guess that you are all aware, well aware of um, huge penetration of mobile devices in the world, but I just put some brief statistics here that are quite impressive. There are almost 7 billion subscribers, but that translates to around 3.5 billion users because there is a kind of uh, ratio in two SIM cards per person. Um, anyways, uh, the, the, the penetration is huge both in emerging, uh, emerging and uh, developed regions. Uh, and I bet that here uh, everybody has a mobile phone and uh, I don't know, raise your hand if you don't have a mobile phone here. Uh, well, yeah, I, I guess that is the, the same answer I would get anywhere in the world. And uh, so the, the fact that we are constantly having, carrying mobile phone devices and leaving uh, the digital traces behind, the di digital traces as a consequence of their usage, uh, creates a great opportunity, but also uh, I know that, that uh, as soon as I say this, that the lawyers get, uh, get, get upset. It also creates many other consequences I see. I saw, saw your, <laughs> your look, uh, but it, it, in, in general it creates, and what I'm going to talk about, in, uh, it creates great potential for to dig into that data and to, um, to assess population behavior at a, at a large scale. And uh, this is actually, um, so first in fact to say what, uh, so even though you have the cheapest phone, the, the old Nokia phones, uh, so non-smartphone or a smartphone without an app, uh, from a mobile network perspective, it is possible to model uh, users' uh, contact network, social activity, um, uh, internet activity, okay, if it's, if it's a smartphone, um, mobility patterns, and so on. So without kind of fancy phones, so this is uh, available for the, for the entire population. And this is what, we, what the, uh, the consequences of, of using the data we'll discuss later on. And, but overall, this is the first time in human history that we have access to such a a huge data of a large scale, scale population behavior. And uh, in one of the reports uh, by uh, MIT uh, technology report, uh, they, they um, indicated this opportunity to, of using big mobile network data as one of the top 10 technological break, breakthroughs. And one of the uh, use cases that they mentioned was, uh, was spread of uh, modeling spread of uh, um, spread of uh, diseases. Um, I want to just underline the fact that uh, here I'm not talking about individual surveillance. I'm not talking about monitoring uh, who you are, who are you talking to, where you are at the moment, where you're moving in general. I'm talking about anonymized, okay, we'll also talk about what anonymized means, uh, anonymized and aggregated, uh, aggregated data in such a way to model population behavior, so uh, no individual sur uh, surveillance whatsoever. Uh, just let me even show you one video that, that demonstrates what I mean by uh, aggregated data. So this is, hope it will work, uh, sorry for the ugly uh, slide, but so this shows actually activity of cell towers, uh, cell towers that are, that are handling all our calls. Uh, so without getting into any identifiable information, so they just sum the number of calls during a uh, one time period, in this case before and after earthquake in Mexico. So using that anonymized and aggregated uh, data, it was possible to uh, understand better the activity in time, the, the human activity in time, and also understand better the locations that were hit uh, most critically by, by the earthquake. Another. Uh, very illustrative example uh, also happened in Mexico during uh, the, the outbreak of H1N1 uh, virus, uh, where the researchers from Telefonica uh, Research uh, managed to model the mobility patterns of uh, using actually around one million people, but they, they modeled the mo uh, mobility patterns of the whole population, as well as the social contact in such a way that they, they uh, managed to predict uh, better than using traditional methods, the, the next points of uh, uh, ep epidemic spread. In addition, so they use these mobility patterns to understand better how governmental measures 
uh, uh, which kind of impact uh, the, the governmental measures had. So I, I think they first closed the schools, then uh, then all the public uh, uh, institutions. They, they shut down the whole country. So at each uh, governmental step, we could have mo we could model uh, how how big impact these um, measures had. Uh, so here I don't have the the. the video from Mexico, but this is, I think, from, yeah, from the UK, uh, which shows these mobility patterns. So without any knowledge about where, where the cities are, you can already guess. And you can see the, all the, the fluctuations of people among uh, big cities and uh, even flights, I think. Uh, so this is just to demonstrate basically the power of uh, uh, modeling the crowd dynamics, modeling the crowd, uh, crowd behavior. So using this kind of data, uh, by using this kind of data, researchers already showed great, great potential to predict crime, to predict uh, air pollution, and even, even individual exposure to air pollution. Uh, then also to quantify certain economical parameters. Uh, and uh, somebody already mentioned here, malaria case in Kenya. And uh, maybe even there are researchers who participated in one of these studies here. Uh, so, um, but, here we, are, we will be talking about challenging of using this big mobile network data for public health. Um, so as you can imagine, it's by no means trivial. So it faces a series of challenges. And uh, in general, storing, accessing, and processing uh, data, which is uh, very sensitive, must adhere to data privacy laws and clear ethical codes. Um, and probably one of the, the key reasons why telcos are very reluctant to the ship to sharing data, even within the research community, uh, relates to liability and risks associated to sharing personal data with experts. Um, there are many other challenges. I think I don't have time now even to mention them briefly. But uh, 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 if the discussion goes into one of these ways, then I will, um, uh, I will elaborate more. But I'll, I'll try actually to keep it uh, shorter. Uh, firstly, out of the specific challenges related to, to, to the ethical issues, I would like to highlight the problem typically referred to as deductive disclosure. Um, so previously, I tried to underline that the data is anonymized and that the data is uh, uh, aggregated. But despite aggregation and despite anonymization, simply the nature of behavioral data is such that some, sometimes even very few observations are, need, uh, are needed to identify persons. And that's a very big, uh, a big problem. Uh, I don't know if you heard of a famous case of AOL that uh, re released, um, I think, search terms, uh, ag again, aggregated on a regional level. The, uh, in fact, it was a very small aggregation. And uh, it was shown, actually, that it was possible to de-identify people. Uh, speaking concretely about telco data, uh, researchers at MIT show that uh, we are actually very unique uh, in terms of mobility patterns. And they show that using mobility patterns, it is possible to uh, identify users. Going back to public health applications, uh, this, in my opinion, has a lower risk because we are not talking about small aggregations. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of people or even millions of people when then uh, uh, it becomes less risky uh, uh, we, are, we are risking less uh, deductive disclosure. Nevertheless, th there are many other uh, examples, uh, such as in medical community, where there is also high risk of uh, deductive disclosure, but they still uh, found their way uh, to work both in research and, and in general in practice. So uh, these are actually good, I think, role models. But again, this is something that probably we'll discuss later on. Um, now this is uh, another question that I wanted to highlight. And this is very slippery. Uh, terminology first, uh, I would say, and a very slippery slippery topic that uh, uh, we had actually a nice discussion over lunch uh, about that. So just a small uh, disclaimer here that by saying ownership, uh, let's for now assume that it's not uh, literal ownership. It's just the right to possess, to use, and to uh, dispose your data. So uh, let's maybe not get into uh, uh, much into 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 the terminology here in any case there is a, a tr transparency of uh, there is a lack uh, a huge lack of transparency data ownership uh, control uh, of the data a possibility to opt out also so although the uh, aggregated people do not have typically possibility to opt out and, and remove their data um, and this is particular in the context of of internet data uh, 
related to these kind of issues that I just raised, um, so first speaking about uh, deducing identities, if you're talking about low level of aggregation, of course, there, there has to be uh, um, a certain guarantee provided that the data, although it, it never can be the 100% the guarantee that the data, although uh, released to, to a specific set of researchers that it cannot be de-identified. But in general, both for research and for ser services, we need a set of uh, very strict data sharing protocols. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, the, uh, in the medical community, they also uh, uh, faced similar challenges, and, uh, but they, they found mostly uh, uh, plausible solutions, I, I, I hope. Um, then there is a lot of research going on around uh, proving that, uh, uh, in fact, proposing methods uh, that although behavioral data, which is highly prone to, um, uh, to be de-identified, de uh, that still can be uh, obfuscated in such a way to reflect the phenomenon that we are studying, but to be impossible to, uh, to be identified. One of the example is location obfuscation, but in general, there is a, there is a, a huge research dedicated on the trade-off between aggregation levels, by aggregation levels I mean individual, spatial, or, or time aggregation, uh, versus uh, how accurate the models, uh, the models can be. Um, maybe now I won't go into details here with the, these two dimensions. Uh, this is something that I put quite last minute uh, about the, these two dimensions of uh, disclosure and ag aggregation. So if we start from the low disclosure, low aggregation, there is a risk, but risk that can be mitigated. So this, I'm, I'm saying, for instance, uh, releasing some data um, that is not aggregated uh, to specific set of researchers with specific authentication and with specific uh, um, tasks to do with that data. As the level of aggregation uh, uh, goes up, there is a lower and lower risk um, for, for the deductive disclosure. But then when we move towards the right part of the disclosure, uh, uh, so if we disclose too much, information. Nevertheless, it was aggregated, then we are not getting any more into these risks of, um, of the, uh, deductive disclosure, but we are getting into other kinds of risks, for instance, uh, social issues. Uh, imagine the situation of um, a politically unstable country where you publicly announce uh, certain groups of uh, where the certain groups of, uh, of people are immigrating, so that that can uh, threat their, um, their, their security in, in uh, politically unstable countries. Uh, going back to this more slippery court uh, about data ownership, there should be mechanisms for giving a control so, and, uh, of the data to users. So uh, again, it depends which data we are talking about, but to enable users to be, uh, to be um, able to remove their data from these aggregated data sets. Uh, however, something that, that I like as a comparison to using uh, uh, when speaking about this uh, uh, very aggregated data, um, in, in this case, uh, telco data, is the comparison with, uh, um, with monitoring traffic. So where users also cannot opt out, right? Uh, which happens also in uh, public health studies where people are counted at certain locations. But the concerns are not that big and that they're at least not so People are not so loud speaking about that as much as about, uh, about the data. Nevertheless, uh, experts agree that um, there should be specific legislation that specify the usage of, uh, of this kind of data. And uh, the lack of international standards can result in, in huge public distrust uh, about using, using this valuable information. Um, so yeah, this, this was supposed to, to symbolize the legislation. Uh, so just to sum up, basically, and, and to keep it shorter, I think it will be much more interesting to, to get into a uh, live discussion about this. So just to, to summarize, we need uh, um, updated technical standards uh, followed by regulation and, uh, and legislation. Uh, as I already mentioned during, uh, during this speech, uh, the, the nature of behavioral data is such that nobody can guarantee 100% uh, de-anonymization. So there will be always that um, uh, that risk, especially when we're speaking about low level of, of aggregation. Um, and uh, to gain trust of, uh, of people, uh, there should be clear communication and clear transparency about, uh, again, the question of however we define the ownership, but more importantly about the control and about the potentials of this data. And uh, as they say, 
sunlight is the best disinfectant. I think also we'll talk about that during discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. I think we'll just hear our speakers and then take all the questions together at the end. Um, our next speaker is Alessandro Spina. Alessandro is a member of the legal department of the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, um, and where he's been the data protection officer since 2011. Before, so Alessandro is, uh, has studied law um, and, um, at the University of Siena, so not far from here, and he has a master's in laws from the University of Oxford and a PhD in law um, and economics, also from the University um, of, of Siena. So his research interests concern the EU data protection law, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. It's a very exciting topic these days in Europe. So European data protection law and health data, um, behavioral algorithmic regulation of big data. And he is going to talk to us about the um, sort of the European, he's going to focus more on the European perspective to those issues while our next speaker then will give us more of the US um, view. Thanks. Thank you, Effie. Thank you to the organizer for the invitation. Um, I am a lawyer, so the first slide will be a disclaimer. Uh, so I think uh, the, the best way to introduce myself is that I will share with you some reflections based on the experience of being a privacy officer at the European Medicine Agency. However, I'm not going to discuss or present views of the institution. And what I want to focus really is, uh, from a very high-level perspective, uh, why big data presents big opportunity for a public health authority, such as the European Medicine Agency or other public health authorities. But I want also to touch upon the regulatory framework for dealing with personal data in Europe. And, uh, you need to be aware that also the European Medicine Agency, like other public institutions, is a regulated body. It's regulated by privacy watchdogs, uh, our European data protection authorities, and we need to respect legislation uh, on data protection. So, um, but I will end with a very positive note that I am a great believer that uh, this represents very big opportunity. There are risks, but we need to address the risks to uh, gain really the benefits that we can uh, harness from big data. Now, this is a sort of syllogism. Big data is all about predictive power, predictive analytics, and I think one of the key tasks of public health institution is really to use public power in a preventive way, in a protective way. So it is almost unavoidable that at certain points, public health institutions will need to address the issue of big data, will need to embed in their institutional decision-making process what big data can bring. However, this is not easy, and uh, this might create uh, turbulence or other frictions. Now, a very interesting project, uh, the European Medicine Agency is involved together with other national drug regulatory agency and some companies and universities, is to use data mined from social media for pharmacovigilance. Now, traditionally, uh, adverse effects of medicines are reported to pharmaceutical companies or the regulator through healthcare professionals or uh, directly from patients. However, there is opportunity for the institutions or companies also to understand what are adverse effects looking at information on social media. And of course, this uh, poses certain issues of privacy because one very important point I want to make to dispel any misunderstanding, and that might be a difference with the US perspective. In Europe, the fact that information are publicly available on internet doesn't detract value from the personal quality of the information. 
So the fact that you have information uh, published on a website or posted on a Twitter account doesn't really make you uh, free to collect and use for whatever purpose or in whatever way you want those information. You are, you become a controller. And this is part of, uh, this has been part of one of the most interesting uh, case before the Court of Justice last year, you might have heard about the right to be forgotten. Uh, the judgment in the Google case, the applicants, Google's claims that they were not controller. They were not controller of personal data because their role of intermediary of information, they were just basically using publicly available information and indexing in their uh, search engine results. But the court said that the mere facts that they were extracting systematically this information from internet made them controller under European data protection legislation. But another, another uh, misconception is that because there is data protection, you can't do things. This is another point that I think really uh, researchers and the society needs to face. This is not true. There are so many instances in which data protection is used for uh, um, not addressing issues that needs to be addressed. The fact that a controller needs to respect data protection legislation doesn't mean that it can or cannot use the data for certain purposes. And I have listed here a few of the basic principles of European data protection legislation. That basically means you need a legal basis, normally consent. However, you can also use other legal basis in EU data protection legislation for processing personal data. And then you should always remind that whenever you process personal data of individuals, and this is going back a bit to what Alexander was introducing about the data ownership, the fact that you process personal data of an individual means that you have certain obligations with respect to how you process the data and what the individuals can do uh, in terms of uh, requesting access to information on how you process, etc. And one of the very important points is that whenever you set out a, a project for big data, you need to think about these three basic principles that are data should be adequate, relevant, and not excessive. Because this is the, uh, the, the, the point of European data protection legislation is one of the corner of the whole legal framework that basically reminds the controller that data, I wouldn't use the term belongs, but there are interests and rights of a third person, of the individuals, in how you process the data. Um, more relevant to public health and big data, I think, are the questions I pose here, and I think this, we are all struggling with, with these kind of questions. For uh, EU data protection legislation, health data are sensitive data, so they are subject to certain more restrictive requirements in terms of processing. But one issue is to what extent lifestyle uh, or other kind of personal data can be considered health data if the person that controls them is able to make a determination on the health of the subject. So if I know that, I mean, if the browsing history of someone can give a proxy to a risk for health uh, of that individual, is that information coupled with that knowledge health data of the individual? Very complicated points, we need to, to address them. Uh, Another point is, is the accountability. Very often, it's not very clear who does what in big data projects, where the data are stored, what kind of secondary use 
today, this morning, we heard uh, from uh, Peter Honemus that data privacy is key. However, he also introduced the concept of track share data. Now, th the whole point is that when we want to promote digital innovation, we also need to uh, rule out an, analo an analo analog concept of data privacy. The analog concept of data privacy means that you control personal data, you anonymize or pseudonymize the data, and then you do whatever. That was the old, the, uh, the old times approach, for example, to certain medical data. We, as Alexander was showing, we are facing a completely different scenario where it is more and more difficult to anonymize, fully anonymize data, because it will always be and it will be more possible to de, uh, 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 de -ident I mean, it will be more, more and, and more difficult to de-identify data when we have so many data sources that can be aggregated together. So the big risks. I think the big risks is the allocation of responsibility in a uh, very complicated ecosystem of data. Another big risk is the lack of transparency. And uh, the lack of transparency cannot be fulfilled by simply ticking some uh, box or doing some paperwork in terms of administrative clearance of projects. And the other two main problems uh, are the facts that when you repurpose data, you might end up in a situation where the conclusions you draw from certain data because of the inherent uh, quality defects might lead to discrimination. And I think this is something that you will need to think in advance when you think about uh, rolling out big data projects. But I think this is really the challenge and this is really a positive note, I think, we need to uh, have a very mature privacy conversation and society needs to be engaged in the same way public health uh, professionals wants the patients to be engaged in, uh, in, uh, in the treatment of disease. We need to have uh, accountability, we need to reinforce accountability in terms of privacy impact assessment, privacy by design, those that control data need to think about uh, the possible impacts for the individuals of the actions and the insights they extract from the information. And then we need also to elaborate on the transparency obligations. Everybody say we want to be transparent, we want to be transparent, but we also need to make sure that the very complex processing of the personal data that we have in big data can be fully understood and uh, uh, fully digested by data subjects. And for this, we need more behavioral informed uh, knowledge of how people decide uh, the, the, the processing of their personal data. And we need to uh, teach, we need to educate uh, people about the logic of algorithm. We need the data subjects to understand the limitation of uh, inferences from data. And I think the last point, and really this is uh, something maybe for Effie and all of you to discuss, is the ethical aspects. I think all of this brings to the fore the needs for having ethical assessments of big data projects, because they will be very important to show the compliance of organizations with respect to data protection legislation. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, our last speaker is Anne Waldo, and I owe her a very special thank you because we did have a very last minute cancellation on our panel. You still see on the program probably at Velasco, at Velasco who was supposed to speak. 
Anne was here um, and was very kind and agreed to join us for the panel, probably taking a break from her holiday. So thank you, Anne. Um, Anne is a lawyer specializing in U.S. privacy law. In a Pudic, uh, she practices in a Pudic law practice in Washington, D.C. that focuses on health consumer um, privacy. She advises companies, especially startups. She is engaged in lobbying and public policy. And she has previously been a chief privacy officer for big pharmaceutical like Ross and uh, for Lenovo, and she's very active in industry consortia, particularly around the issue of health privacy. So we look forward to hearing from her more the U.S. perspective on, on, on privacy. Um, and then is it here? Hi, everybody. Good to meet you, and uh, I was, in fact, on vacation in, in uh, Bologna, staying at a villa with, with uh, five couples this week, and, and in the small world department, I met John last week, and John Brownstein last week in San Diego, and I mentioned I was coming to Italy on vacation this week, and lo and behold, I find myself here with you today, uh, talking about my very favorite topic in the world. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. and. Um, we are going to be covering a lot of the same issues that are important from a, uh, from a European perspective that have just been talked about as well. So this is in many ways the topic of your conference, and I'm not going to belabor this slide at all. This is just talking about the vast benefits from digital data and from putting it to good uses. Uh, I only have this slide in here because as a privacy lawyer, as a privacy wonk, I feel that it is absolutely imperative to never speak about privacy without also speaking about the benefits from data. So we need to protect data, protect individuals, and we need to think about the, the advantages and always think about that balance any more than you would talk about the risks of automobiles without talking about the benefits of being able to get where you want to go. But in the interest of time, I'll let you folks think about the advantages because you are quite aware of that. But thinking for just a moment about the fears. Um, privacy is among a, a sort of collection of vague fears that are rapidly propelling the development of privacy and data protection laws all over the world. And this, these are just a few of the types of things that people worry about. They worry about commercial uses. And, and to one person, the commercial uses of various kinds of big data um, are wonderful. They enable new business models, they provide jobs, they bring about all sorts of fantastic innovation at, at, at affordable prices. Um, others say, oh my gosh, we're going to be exploited by marketeers. And for many, that alone ends the sentence. If, it, if there's a commercial use, it must be bad. Um, I'm not of that persuasion, but there are a lot of people with that perspective. Um, personal health data, sorry, that's an acronym from another slide, personal health data sharing is particularly unsettling today because unlike most of the data sources that were available even 10 or 20 years ago, the data is now coming from much more private areas of our lives, from our bedrooms. My, my Fitbit monitors my sleep actually quite accurately. Um, it comes from baby nurseries. It comes from your ki kitchen counter with your smart coffee pot and, of course, from your, from your very bodies. Um, some of this data is not very personal at all, like how many steps I, talk, I took. Eh, most people think that, most Fitbit users think that's not so personal. But what about as we move toward that progression of getting closer to our bodies? And, we, and what about my breathing? And how, you know, there, there's a, I'm friends with a guy who's a CEO of a startup that would, he would like to be a big competitor to Fitbit, but he measures um, activity levels based on respiration. So the Fitbit, or the device you wear at your waist, but because it's respiration, he can also measure anxiety levels and, and focus levels. Um, very interesting data, but more personal. Um, what about cardiac data, brain activity, sweating, and so on? Um, another source of anxiety was actually touched on um, in the Chicago talk about when, when folks are intervening um, and, and unexpectedly contacting people who didn't expect to be contacted, uh, would they regard that as a helpful tip or a kind of a creepy big brother? I, th I thought I was talking to the world, and, and I also realized that part of the world is my city government, and my city government is talking back to me. I was actually delighted to hear that, that they haven't had a, um, a lot of resistance on that front in, in um, Chicago, because, of course, while we have the European perspective that what you put on the web 
you still own in some way and it isn't public, another way to look at it is like, this is the old fashioned writing a letter to the newspaper. And when I publish my opinion to the newspaper, then any reader of that newspaper has the right to read it and write back and dis perhaps disagree. Um, but then we get to, into much more serious um, and uh, concerns such as um, surveillance. Um, a, a baby monitor uh, not, not too long ago uh, suddenly had a male voice come out of it that said, you know, your baby's diaper is very, or nappy, if there are any uh, folks from England in the audience, you know, is very dirty and you need to put a password on your monitor. So that's, that's more than a little bit creepy um, when there was an, actually a stranger watching the baby's activity. An awful lot of our anxiety about privacy really bleeds into anxiety about security. And it's, these are overlapping Venn diagrams. Um, but security is a massive problem in this area. I would, I would actually say far more than, than literal privacy. Uh, a scanner was, was just someone with, who had a homemade device made out of $75 worth of parts was was scanning uh, women who ran by in a marathon and managed to pick up uh, very sensitive data from over 500 of the devices, including not just name and address, but their user ID number and their password. Uh, so there, you know, that obviously points to a need for far greater security, which is something that Alexandra mentioned as well. And then, and then we go even well past just privacy and thinking about safety. If we have surgical robots that can be hacked, if we have uh, smart doors on our homes, but hackers can break in and unlock the doors. Um, even something as simple as knowing your coffee routine or um, and so on could, could really put people at, at, at risk. And then the last point we could spend hours on, but it's really the issue that you mentioned at the end about the fear not of individual harm, but of group harm. That if, you know, I'm, my identity might not have to be known for me to be harmed by some sort of, of big data application if it's used in an injurious way for my group, such as with insurance or, or employment. So that's the sort of really bad news. Um, but I, but I want to put that out there because I think those concerns are universal. They're not just US and Europe. They are, they're absolutely intrinsic to humanity. But we're living in a world that is changing so fast. We have to deal with them. We can't just put our head in the sand. So now, I thought for a moment we could go to school a little bit. I was asked to give you an acquaintance with US law. And I'm going to divide it into two major camps. There is HIPAA, which is the law that applies to sort of traditional medical data, and then there's everything else. So first off, for HIPAA, the scope is, uh, this gets very technical, and I'm not going to try to take you through this. I have actually an, an eight-hour introduction to HIPAA that I can do, so I'll try to do this in about a minute. Uh, it has a very narrow, very, not actually narrow, but an extremely well-defined scope. The, the shorthand for it is it's any kind of traditional healthcare entity you might think of. That's a really rough and dirty uh, definition, but it's, it's doctors, it's pharmacies, it's hospitals, it's health insurance companies, and the business associates are, are a defined set of vendors who work for those entities and have to access a very particular kind of data, which we call PHI, protected health information. The definition goes on for about a page and a half. Um, very technical. In, in, HIP, in the US, uh, completely unlike Europe, um, privacy laws are 100% context sensitive. In other words, the, the protections do not follow the data wherever the data moves around the ecosphere. Uh, if, if I talk to John and he is uh, an MD and I tell him about my health but he's not in any way treating me, that's not PHI, it's not covered by HIPAA, but the moment I say, you know, I'm worried about my sore toe, we suddenly transferred the, the relationship and it's now a doctor-patient relationship even if I'm not paying him any money and, and a completely different set of rules apply. Um, the HIPAA is enforced rigorously by the US Department of Health and Human Services as well as now by state attorneys general. And believe me, if you're a compliance lawyer as I am, we take those authorities very, very seriously. They, we, they have uh, big sticks. HIPAA is also extremely complex. It's probably the most complex privacy law anywhere in the world. Um, that's a product of how it was created. Uh, just want you to be aware of that. If you're thinking about different regulatory models, this one highly detailed, highly prescriptive uh, system does exist. It's also very document heavy. Also means that, that compliance with it is really expensive. I have startup clients who come to me and say, you know, for you know, for ten or twenty, thirty thousand dollars, can I become HIPAA compliant? And and I'm increasingly saying no. You know, it's it's just too complex. 
Um, again, substantial fines, um, very painful settlements. There is a, a free zone, which we call TPO, treatment payment operations. Within that zone, data sharing is permitted. But if you are going to exit that HIPAA land zone, then you, in most cases, need consent, and not just a general consent, a very specific HIPAA consent called an authorization with a dozen mandatory elements. The result of all of this is that in HIPAA land, in traditional healthcare in the US, we have an extremely closed data sharing culture. Uh, there's the, the incentives are misaligned for data to be shared, even when it's fully permissible for data to be shared even with patients themselves, even when patients have a legal right to the data. And again, we could spend an hour on that because I'm very, very passionate about patients getting better access to their data. Um, the one thing to know about where this line exists is that it is historical and legal. There's nothing logical or intuitive about it. Um, just very quickly, if, if I run into a, a, a grocery store that also has a pharmacy and I say I have a, a raging sore throat, where can I find secrets or cough, cough drops? Um, if I say that to the pharmacy clerk, that's covered by HIPAA. All of these thousands of pages of rules apply. If I say it to a grocery store clerk five steps away, not covered by HIPAA. Um, that's one that, that tends to startle people. Um, in, the, in, the, um, in the digital era, if I'm on my doctor's patient portal and I type my symptoms in and I type in my exercise data, 100% covered by HIPAA, the exact same functionality run by a private um, personal health record, any kind of private um, online uh, entity, not covered by HIPAA. Uh, so just to give you a, a little bit of an of a exposure to consumer law, this is what applies to everything else, including most of the data that you folks have been talking about in the last few days. And the number one thing that I, uh, myth that I want to dispel is that no law applies. I often hear that it's the wild, in fact, doctors in the U.S. will say there's there's no law governing medical privacy in um, the United States. And I'm like, no, 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 there's so much law. There is both federal and, and all 50 states have consumer protection laws. There are also dozens and dozens of highly specific laws, as well as 47 state um, breach notice laws saying that if there's an accident involving data, the individual has to be told. Um, the scope of these consumer protection laws is extremely broad. It's every kind of entity in, and all types of data. They're enforced by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, as well as state attorneys general. Most of the states have triple damages brought in, so your damages get very bad very quickly. There are also private lawsuits and class actions um, that you have to worry about as, as a business or a compliance lawyer in the U.S., um, much more so than any other environment in the world. Sometimes Europeans, I mean, maybe often Europeans criticize American privacy law for saying that it doesn't have teeth and so on. And, and one of the things that isn't well understood is the scope of these consumer protection laws, the breadth of the regulatory authority, as well as our terror of being brought into a class action that can just bring your company uh, down in, in a crippling way. Um, what are these laws based on? Because I think this may have some insights as we try to move into the brave new world of what to do with all this digital data and how to manage it responsibly. They're based on two prongs. One is misrepresentation. The other is unfairness. Under all of these federal and state laws, you cannot do anything that is deceptive. And you also can't do anything that's unfair. And if this sounds vague and high level, it really is. In fact, it becomes much more like European law. Uh, which is generally fairly high level, at least um, at, at the international level. So using a reasonableness standard, pr privacy, in the privacy context, deception usually means that you said something in your privacy statement that isn't true, um, or even is a little bit misleading. And where companies get tripped up can be as simple as saying, we use reasonable security methods. And then it turns out that they didn't use reasonable security methods, that is absolutely treated by regulators as a lie. So, and if you're stupid enough to say we use best practices, we use industry leading practices, and then you have, have a hacker get in, um, just open your checkbook because you're gonna pay. Um, despite, and then, the, sorry, the unfairness I think has some insights for us as well. Um, unfairness basically means having unacceptable security. You see, they can catch you either way on that. Um, or anything that's really onerous or particularly startling, and you put it in your terms of agreement, you got the consumer to, to click I agree, but if it still would sort of shock the conscience, regulators are likely to blow right through it and say, that's unfair. Um, 
and despite these big challenges, we have a, um, a, a much more open consumer data culture, as, as you know. So I have lots of thoughts about where we go from here, but I think we, we should move into the, into the discussion and question side. Um, just so you know, th th I've sort of boxed them into um, suggestions for actual innovators, for companies. Um, these are the thing, th this is basically the way I practice law. This is how I tell my clients to operate. The bottom line, the most important thing is say what you do and, and then do what you say. Um, I have thoughts about the research context, which is what you guys are really focused on. Um, really, you know, please, please, please anonymize data wherever possible, knowing that anonymization uh, is not perfect, but that you want to get to that place where the risk is very small. And there are much more sophisticated modern technologies available than, than before. Really focus on preventing harm, actual harm to human individuals. I suggest having a bright line between observational research and anything interventional as well as seeking consensus on, on best practices, and I know the group is beginning to, to explore that, um, having some kinds of, of definitions about the best way to do this responsibly. And then uh, there, I think we're gonna move on and talk about this, so I'll stop here, but this is, there's a, there's, are a lot of consequences with regard to public policy of what is the best way to, to approach this, this data, and these are, these are some of my opinions which we can get into. Thanks. We don't have a microphone here, but um, I have tons of questions, but I'm thinking um, if you'd like, if we have questions from the audience, maybe we start with those. Uh, you just identify yourself and I will look for a mic. Thanks. Um, I want to just connect back to um, Jennifer Cole's rapid fire talk earlier today where she talked about a lot, some of these issues and the fact that uh, a lot of times people don't want to create online forums basically because they're afraid of being sued. So I think, I mean, I think all the panelists touched on it a little bit, but I just Want to, would like to hear more thoughts about how do we prevent, while well, respecting privacy and the full set of ethical issues, how do we prevent that from having a chilling effect on the innovation? And also, in, some, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, vulnerable populations uh, that sort of need the most attention are sometimes uh, you know, underrepresented, specifically because of fears around uh, these legal issues. So, you know, I just, just question is how do we balance the, the, these factors and what are kind of some, some good approaches there? Yeah, I think very good questions. I think the model of the very burdensome administrative requirements you need to uh, tick in order to be compliance with privacy laws would be a very good step for any of these projects. I mean, it is true that some platforms or some new uh, media outlets offer the possibility sometimes to shortcut some uh, burdensome legal requirements. But if you do a very thorough assessments of the privacy risks associated with the projects. And then you, for example, rebalance certain limitations you have because, for example, you don't control uh, certain, certain elements of a, of a platform with increased transparency and increased accountability on how the information is processed uh, what are the limitation examples? If you are really proactive in informing the data subjects, that is a, would be a very good start. So I think to a certain extent, we need to move forwards and understand that in a digital context, some obligations needs to be elaborated, needs really to go a bit farther than 
what are, for example, the usual obligations you have to take if you want to engage with uh, persons with a certain disease in a different setting. I don't think, I mean, it is not possible to provide a clear-cut answer also because the law is moving. And I think Anne might, might share this, this view also from the other side of the ponds. At least in Europe, data protection legislation is moving. Uh, we are understanding, for example, after the, 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 the two judgments last year of the Court of Justice, that metadata are important from a privacy perspective. And that was mirrored also in the US law. So to a certain extent, the two jurisdictions are moving forward to understanding the complexity of the digital environments. Uh, and in this moving scenario, it's, it's very important to be cautious. But cautious doesn't mean don't do things. I mean, that, that's something I wanted to make clear. Often data protection or other part of, of uh, or, or other legal issues like liability, etc., are used as a mechanism to generate inertia. I think we need to have a completely different uh, approach to it. We need to look at data protection as a actually a possibility to facilitate the uh, creation of that trust that is necessary for engaging patients, etc. So to, we need to reverse the idea that data protection law is a nightmare you need to face at a certain point and to think maybe we can understand what are the values that data protection legislation wants to protect in order to make our projects uh, uh, very user-friendly and respectful of, of certain, um, of, of the privacy of the users. Then the other questions you pose is really for, for scientists, I mean the limitation for certain disease of the amount of information you can have on the internet, that's, I think it's a, it is quite a big limitation in terms of uh, moving completely towards a, a sort of digital uh, a system for, uh, uh, um, for overseeing uh, public health issues. And uh, this is something we have to remind. I think that in the percentage in Italy of people connecting to the internet or in other European countries connecting to the internet once a week is still very high. And we are talking not about people having a smartphone and being always connected, but people that connect to internet for a very limited period of time once a week. So maybe I'll just follow on that question um, a little bit. So you're both saying that um, we are at a time in history where the, we have these challenges, but the regulatory framework is under pressure and it's probably moving somewhere. But we don't know exactly where it's going. Um, we may have a general idea. So what are we doing now, right now? Well, we're not exactly sure. We have maybe the analog model of privacy, as you called it. Our projects are not analog and we need to act. So do you, what would be your suggestion? Obviously, we're not going to be illegal because we don't want to that. We'd have a compliance strategy, but there are gaps. How are we filling those? Sure. Um, which answer I give depends very much on which hat I'm wearing. When I'm when I'm a lawyer in private practice helping a client, including I, one I helped that was related to the last question, that was building online patient communities, and we. We spent a lot of time thinking about how to do that in a very respectful way, using the privacy by design. It's an area where we, we are in emphatic agreement. Um, we're probably being very polite about the areas where we don't agree. Um, but um, you know, there are ways, actually, to grow a business, to do, to do new cutting edge research, and, and still manage to not be illegal and not offend people, and I think that we should all work harder to, do, to have more clarity around what those are under existing law. That said, if you ask me wearing my, my public policy hat, 
uh, you know, it's, it's some of these ideas. I, I really would like to make a plea for regulators and policy influencers to have a light touch when thinking about how to regulate in this new world that's changing so quickly. For example, one of the pillars of privacy law in, in Europe as well as in the US is the concept of notice and choice. So you, and with choice or, or consent being at the center of everything. So that basically means whenever you give your data for any purpose, you're gonna be told how it's used and it can never be used for any other purpose because that would be called a secondary use. And if it's a second, in Europe it's often called not compatible with the original use. Well, that it flies in the face of everything that you guys have been talking about in this conference. And so the point is, how can we use all this data to dramatically help humanity address its problems? And I, I think we need to be honest about the fact that our privacy law regimens, both in the Europe and US and throughout the world, that are so based on consent are, are really the wrong model going forward. And we need to focus much more on how do we prevent people from being actually harmed? Not having their data protected, but themselves protect. Let's protect people, not protect quite so much focus on protecting data. Rumi? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Rumi Chinara, NYU. Uh, thanks for the panel. Um, obviously, this data is very pervasive, and these are all very important factors. I was just curious which of these um, factors, if any, are particular to the area of health, or do you think that these are just important things to consider in general using digital data? Thanks. Which factors? Any of these topics in terms of like regulation, things, privacy consideration, is anything specific to the area of health? Like we've commonly thought of these in this area in terms of HIPAA, all these things have been developed in the area of medical research, but um, how about now? Is there anything specific to health or is it broadly applicable in every domain? Um, and also maybe, when you know we respond to that, maybe you also want to come away in um, in relation to this question. How, given that we can infer health information from data that we wouldn't necessarily call them health data or medical data uh, in the, in our old taxonomies, does this make all data then um, sensitive in that sense? Because so far we had the clinical data that we treat in a particular way, the genetic data that we treat in a particular way, but our shopping data not treating in a particular way. So that's a mi mixing categories. And so that goes back, what does apply? Is this still a specific category that we're talking about, or it's a mixed bag of things? Probably mixed, right. Um, you want to go with the, with the legal aspects or? <laughs> So for the... Um, yeah, you see that as a mixed Well, um, so I think it's it, uh, what I want to say, I, I will actually go a bit back what uh, what we were discussing in, in the previous question, but it can be related to this one. So what, where, where are we now? And, and to get into actually the... Um, the mix of the, the, the technological data and, and healthcare data. So um, specifically, there is a very blurry... Um, uh, very blurry guidelines, but very blurry uh, regulation when it comes to mixing to, uh, two kinds of data. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm uh, particularly referring to technologically acquired data and, and uh, medical data. And I think I saw a couple of researchers here for, for whom I know that they were working on, on, on this kind of uh, studies. And uh, we're really going through hell proving to ethical committees um, the full anonymization because once you cross two data, then there is Nobody knows practically what, what can come out of that. So, uh, and this postpones a lot uh, our study. So, uh, uh, just if there have had been uh, the, the regulation that can help practically both us and, and uh, people in ethical committee that, uh, that are not IT persons, that we cannot explain what, even speaking simply about what hashing function means. So how we, for instance, anonymize telco data, but here I was not referring 
only to telco data, just in general data, when you cross with uh, with medical, this is something that that becomes even more slippery and and uh, much more difficult for us. And uh, this postponed study a lot, and sometimes even we were unable to do the studies because of that. I think that's a really really important question, and we should we should be um, very cautious actually about going down this slippery slope of saying. Well, all this other non-health data can be used for healthcare. You know, my Fitbit data, of course, can be used for health purposes and so on. I really do think there's a meaningful and important distinction between what I tell my doctor when I am counting on my doctor keeping it private and other kinds of data and that society should think a lot about that line before they obliterate it and say, well, all personal data can be used for health purposes. Because what that leads to in European law is that sense, if it's all health data, then it's all sensitive. Sensitive data requires express consent. And that leads into a world where the kinds of research you're talking about just isn't, isn't possible legally without a dramatic change in the laws. But maybe that's a realization to make. Because as long as we make those distinctions, we stick back to consent as solving the problem. But if we realize that this is what we're having, we do have these very blurred categories. Maybe consent is not going to solve the problem. It's going to do some of the work, and maybe we have to clarify how much of the work is going to be, and then search for other ways to secure and protect what we really need to protect, rather than sticking back to a model that is just re-enforces um, categories and taxonomies that don't really work. So just, just a quick, very, very quick illustration of... Uh, of yeah, sorry. Ah, uh, so what uh, what Effie said, just very quick illustration of uh, how consents um, are not any more reliable. In fact, um, maybe even they, not they will die completely. But um, so the the the, the um, very good example actually that I encountered myself when giving uh, participants a consent form for signing that they can uh, that we can sample their Wi-Fi signal strength only. And uh, so before signing, I was telling them, yeah, but this is how we can. So I'm fine completely with Wi-Fi. But then when you tell them that you can infer a location out of that, and technically you're not obliged to say that if you say what you're sampling, that's it. But after, after they realize that you can uh, infer their location, they become more, uh, more cautious. So this is just the, the very short illustration what consent, uh, the, the drawbacks of consent nowadays with, with the data that, that people do not know the, the, their full potential. So, thirty seconds. I think that what Peter said this morning that from data, they, metadata, you can infer actually health conditions. So, if there is no traffic of emails, then there is a high likelihood of depression. I have to say, I'm very skeptical about the use you make of this kind of, of data from a clinical and scientific point of view. And quality is very important. We, as a public health authority, the European Medicine Agency, is fully aware of what can happen in terms of communication and risks for public health when you decontextualize information, when you use bad data, when you use biased inferences. So we need to be careful about that. And uh, that's something, if you don't, the, the, the point is the protection of health data is necessary because health data is actually sensitive for a, 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 an important reason that really is able to disclose sensitive information about an individual. And when you use other kind of data to infer health data of an individual, you really need to be careful about proving, uh, about having substantiated uh, causali causality uh, relationship because otherwise we, 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 we are entering into a very, very uh, slippery and, um, uh, well, unpleasant domain. We'll end on the note of caution. And uh, thank you all very much for being here and to the panelists. Thank you.